I was afraid I was going to land on my, my forehead on the top on the top step and well none of us want that welcome back um, I, I hope that you had a good week I, I think I did and at our home it's always very busy um, and like I said I've, I've gained a new appreciation having to do two Sundays in a row for the pastor and the amount of preparation and the thought and 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 everything that goes into um, being here and um, so appreciate Josh and his his flexibility he'd asked me hey what do you think about music and what what songs might be appropriate and I just no idea um, where to direct him on on some of those things and and he's done just a marvelous marvelous job I'm going to spend a few minutes um, as we start into this um, with looking at last week just for the, some of the passages that we looked at um, and then go on to my points three and four um, if you remember uh, what they were if you remember we started talking about the fruit that is in the Bible um, and the Bible's full of fruit uh, trees bearing fruit fruits and parables um, fruits of the spirit that we just read um, this morning and so I came up with some some things that I want to talk about um, why is an understanding of fruit important um, what is fruit how do we bear fruit we're going to talk about that a little bit more this morning and ask the question are you a producer um, the definition that I've been running with um, about fruit is a usually sweet food that grows on a tree or a bush. Um, it's the part of the plant that has the seeds in it, um, such as a pod of a pea, a nut, grain, or a berry. And the third one, a result or reward that comes from some action or activity. And this looking at this definition is important because all of these definitions we find in scripture um, we see fruits of the land we see fruit being used as a metaphor or analogy of the works that happen in people's lives and the results but even more a literal definition is the result or reward so these this usage of the word fruit is throughout scripture and used in all of these ways so why is fruit and understanding of fruit important? Um, because in Luke 6 we see, for each tree is known by its own fruit. So fruit is how we recognize plants. And examining fruit helps us to identify its source. Matthew 7 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Fruit in someone's life helps us to determine true and false teachers. And Matthew 12, 33 says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. We know from scripture from Christ's words that it's what's inside that bears fruit and that good fruit comes from good sources and bad from bad John 15 tells us by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples so an understanding of fruit is important because we know that it's how producers of fruit are recognized we know that it helps us to identify truth and false teachers. We know that it's what's inside that bears fruit. So, if we're not, as we look inside ourselves, and we're not bearing the fruit that we think we should, we need to, we need to be able to recognize that. And that fruit in our lives can glorify God, and it identifies us as His. So it's important. 
Then we talked about what is fruit. We talked about the source, that Jesus is the vine. In John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. So Jesus is the vine. It's the structure that, we, that God builds this tree on. Jesus is the foundation from where we come from. And God is the vine dresser, we read in that passage, who prunes, trims, directs, and structures the growth. And we learn from this passage that you and I are to abide in Christ. We are to stay connected and recognize our dependence upon him. Because apart from him, we know we cannot do anything. We will not bear fruit. And God's word is to abide in us. It's supposed to live inside of us. Ephesians 2 told us that we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ for good works. So this fruit is going to be produced. These results of the Christian life are going to be produced in our lives with a source of Christ, with a spirit working inside us. So, some of the things that we looked at last week, these fruits, these good works of the Christian life, James 1, 18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I describe this as the initial fruit that is evident in the Christian's life, salvation. The second one we looked at was the fruit of repentance. And we talked about John the Baptist when the Pharisees came to be baptized and he told them, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He was cautious, he was nervous that, yeah, they were coming here, they were repenting, but was it true repentance? And so he wanted to see fruit. He said, show me fruit from this repentance. And re what is repentance? We talked about that. That change in direction, a change in life. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit. We read it again this morning. The fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things are, there is no law. And we'll look at those words a little bit more today. But the Spirit is going to be producing something in our lives, the, this activity. And then lastly, we talked about the fruit of the gospel, that fruit, definition number two, produces seeds that need to be spread. And as we are producing fruit, we're going to be producing seed that is given out. And that's the proclamation of the gospel. We need to take that opportunity and give it out. So we're back to Galatians 5, 16 through 25. How do we bear fruit? Verse 16, the first verse, gives us, I think, the, the key. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. There's a clear division in this passage. There's two types of fruit. It doesn't name the evil things, the bad things that are coming out of the person's life as fruit, but as we understand from the definition, fruits are the result of something. And so it's, this section is divided up into two different things, bad fruit, good fruit. And we see the source, because we, as we've learned, from the fruit, you can understand what the source is. You can't identify, I can't, most people can't identify a pear tree versus an apple tree without seeing the fruit on it. Unless you happen to know, okay, this is, you know, the type of leaf structure, or you happen to know that it's an apple grove. But most of us, unless you're in an agricultural area, can't necessarily identify without fruit. So fruit helps us to look at what's going on inside. Bad fruit, well, inside, are produced by desires of the flesh, the sinful, fallen part of us. And you want to know something? We don't have to do anything to produce that kind of fruit. We produce it on our own. Just by our natural, normal walking around. Everybody does. Guaranteed, you walk outside and start looking around, watch the news for about 35 seconds, and you can see these types of fruits being um, produced. You've read this, these, this list before, and, and most of us, you know, we're, we're Sunday morning worshipers, and um, we, we say we're, we're Christians, and so we look at this and say, you know, um, sexual immorality, all right, I'm pretty good with that. Um, impurity, I, I brush my teeth, no impurities there. Um, sensuality, um, you know, I don't watch those kind of movies. Um, idolatry, no, no, no Buddha's statues in my house, good with that. Um, sorcery, definitely not. Closest thing, I might have watched Harry Potter. Um, I, enmity, oh, I, I'm not sure what that is. Don't worry about that. Um, strife, well, I, yeah, I had this conversation with the worker at the cubicle next to me. Um, we're not getting along so well, but as long as everybody's quiet, we're good. Jealousy, except for the fact that we have a couple members that drive um, really cool cars, I'm, I'm good with this. Um, not a problem. Um, fits of anger, except for 169, northbound at 5 o'clock, the rest of my life is fine with that. Um, rivalries. Um, we just don't go to soccer games anymore. Um, do you see my point as I go through this list? You know, we know sexual immorality starts in the heart, um, and if we commit um, lust within our heart, it's the same as, as doing it. We know that from Scripture. Sometimes we don't believe it. Sometimes we don't, we, we believe it here, but we don't believe it here. Um, so that's, what, that's why it's easy to gloss over some of these. But if we start examining our lives, these things are produced without any effort whatsoever. This fruit that is in that, that list is, is easy to come by. But verse 16 says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In verse, that's verse 16, verse 25, it says in two different ways, live by the Spirit, or keep in step with the Spirit. It's a big reminder that good fruit is not of ourselves, because we know what we can produce on our own. Um, and it comes nowhere 
from other than a connection to the vine that we've, that we've read about. That fruit and good fruit is produced by being an attachment to Jesus. It's living by the Spirit. It's having the Holy Spirit take action and priority in our lives. Uh, so how? First of all, it must start with salvation. And I mentioned this last week. I want to emphasize it a little bit. Acts 16, 30 through 31 says, Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. We must trust that the only way to walk by the Spirit, to have the Spirit come inside you, is to trust in the vine of Jesus Christ. And Peter's sermon to the, the thousand in, in Acts, he, it says, Now when they heard this, the, the word that he was speaking about Christ and who he was, they heard this and they were cut to the heart. And Peter said to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we know from Scripture that without salvation, without the Holy Spirit coming into us, there is no hope. We will produce that other kind of fruit. So we need to know that the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. We must repent, which we learned is a change in direction. It's a change in action. And as Peter's sermon shows us, be baptized. These are the first fruits of salvation. A change in the heart is fruit. Repentance is fruit. Baptism is that acting out the result of what's gone on inside. It's obedience. So Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says, For grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. We read this last week, but it's here that I always want to make sure we understand that as we jump into good, good fruit, good works, there can never be any question where the, they come from because we can't do it on our own. It's not, it, it, we produce this ugly, gross stuff. You know, we talked about last week, a healthy tree, beautiful tree, you expect to see beautiful, healthy fruit coming from it. But the only thing you're going to get from a dead tree is either no, fret, no fruit or a dying tree, gross, decaying fruit. So we need to always keep in mind, in the far front of our minds, that it's the Holy Spirit that is the producer. So after salvation, what is the next thing? What fruit is to be produced? Matthew 13, 23. We've read this. Pastors read companion passages as we've been going through Mark. Uh, as for what was sown, it's at the end of the, the parable of the, the sower. As for what was sown on good soil, that is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, in another, sixty, and in another, thirty. So in order to produce good fruit, verse 23 says, the one who hears the word and understands it. Friends, how are we expecting to bear fruit, good fruit, if we spend no time in God's word? We need to spend time reading it, studying it, being under good teaching of it. 
I, I'm, I'll be honest, I, was, I came under conviction. Whenever I've got a, this, the last two, three weeks, um, I've spent more time in the Word than I have in months as I've been preparing for these sermons. And I kept remembering, you know, this is the way it should be all the time. I should be excited to get in there. And even without the pressure of, okay, I'm going to be standing up in front of everyone and I've got I to gotta say something. Um, why, why am I not researching and reading under normal circumstances like I do for, for this opportunity? We can't expect to be bearing fruit, good fruit, without spending time in, in God's Word. But also, we need to be practicing. We need to be practicing good works. Uh, I quoted out of the, the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Um, last week, I'm going to do it again. Um, chapter 16, um, section 2. Come and ask me why I like the, the London Baptist Confession um, so much sometime. I, I won't go into it now, but um, I've had opportunities to study it next to the, my Bible. I've had opportunities to teach through the 30, uh, I shouldn't have started that, 32 or 36 cha chapters. Um, it, it's, it's an amazing document that helps to put a point on um, a lot of things that we tend to be fuzzy on. Um, it's also a great opportunity, good study help to defend your faith. Chapter 16, section 2, talking about good works. These good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith. And by them, believers manifest their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, adorn the profession of the gospel, and stop the mouths of adversaries and glorify God, whose workmanship they are, created in Christ Jesus thereunto, and having their fruit unto holiness, they may have the end and eternal life. Then there are all the, the passages that, if I sat down and tried to, to read all of them to you, it would... I'm afraid it would be um, a mess, but the emphasis is that these good works show out their fruits in thankfulness in the believer's lives, strengthen the assurance of our salvation, edify, they lift up brothers, and adorn the profession of the gospel. Did you know you're a gospel professional if you're a believer? We don't use this terminology much these days. But in 1689, in the 1600s, it was, a, it was a much more common way of referring to us. Adorn the profession of the gospel. We're professional Christians. You know, it's not, it's not amateur hour. We are to take this job as believers seriously, as professionals. Good works stop the mouths of adversaries. What's one of the first things that we hear from non-believers as they, they point at Christians? Hey, but look at, look at what they did or what they're doing. If our good works were so out and far beyond our, our mess-ups, it would have the, the effect of closing the mouths of those that speak out against the gospel. And our good works, they glorify God. 1 John 2, 3 through 6 echoes this. And, I know, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his root word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. There's the assurance of our salvation. Now returning back to Galatians 16 or Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit manifesting in our lives. Lives that aren't self-serving. That are, they're not for our own consumption. They exist, these fruits, and we're going to look at them just similarly as we did last week, but I want you to think about these as they impact the world around us. These are walking the way Jesus walked, showing his face and his hands and his feet to the world. Love. Last week I described love as true love, not self-serving, but radical, sacrificial love for others. Giving without getting. How does that impact the world around you when your love for others outweighs your love for self? When you're ready to self sacrifice your, your activities? Peace. Contentment with your circumstance. Dependence upon the vine that you're connected to. How does peace in your own life, yeah, there's a benefit. We're able to be calm and collected and be able to, to focus in our own lives. But how do people respond when they see a life of peace? They want to know the source. They want to understand where it's coming from. Patience. Long-suffering. Perseverance, sticking with it, with whatever the task is at hand, and focus, a, stad, a steadfastness, enduring the poor treatment in this life. When you show patience for someone, some situation, is that normal? Do you see an outpouring of patience in the world today? No. It's we need to get this done. We need to take care of this. Why, you know, why are you still standing there? Um, patience for circumstance. Hey, you need to get this taken care of. You know, I don't, I don't care how it's going to impact them. You need to get this done. Patience. Waiting. Not avoiding what needs to be done but focusing on the important things. Kindness, looking to meet the needs of others, empathy and caring for others that overflows from what, oh, from how you have also been shown grace and mercy. Again, when you show kindness that's so uncommon in the fruits of what normally comes out of most people's lives, in opposition to that, kindness, people want to understand the source. They see fruit, they want to see where it's coming from. Goodness, reflecting on the righteousness of God. It's an understanding and practicing and expressing God's character. Faithfulness, expressing integrity in your dependence upon God and his, for his provision. Depend, devotion to your Savior. Gentleness. Forgiving, correcting with kindness, meekness, power, and power under self-control. They're, they're characteristics of Jesus. I mean, we read those and go, oh, yeah, Jesus got that, Jesus got that, Jesus got that. Um, if these are practiced, and it takes practice, we all know it. But with the Holy Spirit working in our lives, being conscious of it, Jesus' hands and feet can start getting out. And last one, self-control. And this one, I, I, I struggled with this one when I was trying to get a good working definition, looking at what other guys had said. And um, this is what I came up with. Allowing ourselves to be controlled by the Holy Spirit instead of giving in to our own sinful fleshly desires. Giving up daily to God's desires. My wife is 
ex ex I can't say this word, exemplary, she's good at um, getting up in the morning. And if you're one of our Facebook friends, you'll see passages of scripture. And I'm not saying this just to, to be, boost up her ego or anything, but it's something that I admire in her. Her first thing is getting into God's word and reading it and setting it out for her, her day. And it's never been something I've tried. I've, you know, I've, you know, 101 steps to, you know, having a morning devotion and all these things and never been able to perfect that, that activity. Um, but if you look at my wife's life, you can see the fruit that comes from that. And this is where it is that she has worked on her self-control to the point where she's giving up those sinful desires and giving into God's direction path. And it's by studying the word in the mornings. Um, Self-control in this list of fruits of the spirit, I think shows a good path where to start with the rest of it. Because as we look to God's word and as we emphasize God's desires, the Holy Spirit acting in our lives, we start to walk by the Spirit. But it takes practice. That's why I said the practice of good works. It takes exercise. It's not gonna, these things don't happen overnight. We don't all of a sudden, well, I'm going to be patient today. And I want it now. I want patience now. It takes practice. And it takes patience. So, lastly, are we producers? couple of different places. Both Paul and Peter tell us to examine ourselves. Paul in 2 Corinthians says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. And 2 Peter 1, 3 through 10, Peter tells us, his divine power has granted to us all the things that pretend to pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them they you may become partakers in the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire for this very reason make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to go through all those those descriptions because I think they sounded awfully familiar to the passage we just left in Galatians. But in verse 9 it says, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Peter and Paul, not surprising, they were on the same page on this, that after salvation, we should expect fruit to be produced. If we look at our lives and we're called to examine our lives, we're supposed to be looking. You know, I meet so many people that all they're concerned with is, you know, what's happening tonight, what's happening tomorrow, what's happening the next day. And they don't spend any time for reflection on what's going on in their own, own self, um, what's going on in their own lives. They don't take time to meditate on God's word and let it reveal what's going on in their lives. They 
they're just flying by the seat of their pants from moment to moment. The Christian life is, has reflection in it. It has lots of action, but it has reflection, and we are called to take the time to examine ourselves. And that's where we're going to leave this morning. We need to take a moment to examine ourselves. Where are you in this fruit cycle? Um, has the seed of the word been sown in your life? I presented the gospel this morning. Our pastor is diligent and faithful to present the gospel every Sunday. We have lots of sermon topics. We're going through studies. But pastor presents the heart of the gospel. Jesus crucified. Repent of your sins. Be saved. So has the seed of the word been sown in your life? If not, what kind of ground are you going to be? Are you going to be ready to accept it, or is, are you just going to be uninterested, hard ground, looking to the cares of the world? Or ground that is ready and willing to have the plant grow, the seed um, mature. So, is your Christian life newly planted? Not bearing much fruit yet. Maybe just a little sprig out of the ground and everybody looks at it and doesn't know really what it is yet. Could be a tree, could be a thorn bush, not sure. That's the start. Remember, the first fruits is salvation, repentance. But are you ready? Are you ready to grow? Because the plant is recognized by the fruit. Or have you been a Christian for a long time? You're a tree, mature tree, but just an ornamental fruit tree. I had never heard of Bradford pears before I moved to Oklahoma, and they're everywhere here, in, in, especially in Tulsa. Um, and I was asking, you know, what is that? Well, it's a Bradford pear. Well, where's the pears? Well, they don't produce fruit. What use is a fruit pear tree if it doesn't produce fruit? Um, I didn't attempt or presume to curse it, um, but there is precedent. Is your Christian life an ornamental fruit tree? We need to examine ourselves. You know, we're a beautiful tree, produce flowers, no fruit. Or do you see the Spirit of God working inside you, bearing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Awesome. That's not the end. Because the ex expectation is that we are to be also seed bearers, spreading this fruit, taking this fruit. Because if the fruit just stays on the tree, it doesn't do anything. It, it, it helps the people go, look, you know, there's, something's going on there. But until it's taken off the tree, consumed, planted, doesn't bear another believer, it doesn't, doesn't bear other fruit. Um, we, had a, um, we had a pear tree, speaking of pears, a real pear tree produced pears um, when we lived in Shawnee. And it produced so many pears that no matter what I did, every, every summer, I couldn't keep up with it. And we'd have people drive by and, hey, can I have pears? Yes, take as many as you want. Um, but not to be too graphic, but at the end of the summer, so many of the pears had fallen to the ground 
and nothing been done with them, it just, it reeked of rotten pears underneath that tree. Um, so I, I don't want you to take the analogy too far, but if you're a fruit tree and you're not distributing your fruit, making use of it the way God wants to, you know what happens? It just gets rotten, it gets unused. So if you're a Christian, God put the Holy Spirit in there to bear fruit, but not for your own self. He did it so that it might be spread, that you would take this peace, joy, patience, and give it to others, that you take that gospel seed and spread it out. And as the pastor said two weeks ago, you know, it's, the job isn't, you know, it's not this careful planting of seeds. It's the distribution. And then depend on God to take care of it. Are you part of the production cycle? We're not producers on our own. The Holy Spirit is what produces the fruit in us. But we are called to be part of the cycle. Would you pray with me?